Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Sorry to interrupt just uh, when the discussion was uh, according to me heating up. Um, I would like to say first that uh, it has been a real pleasure to, to attend this conference. And uh, I would like to, to thank our um, um, long-standing partners, TASC, for, um, for the organization of this uh, event, which has been now, uh, and especially to David Bag, uh, we have come to, to this seventh uh, annual conference. So um, it's, a, it's a good uh, row of, um, it's, a good, um, uh, it's a good process we are having. Um, and I would like to thank uh, everyone, especially the, the ones uh, uh, in the audience and uh, the ones, uh, those faces we do not see, who are behind the, um, the doors and behind the, the curtains, who have organized this, uh, um, this, uh, this conference. But um, uh, let me say, because I'm an economist, so James, I take all the blame for that. Um, let me say a few things about um, uh, what is the main explanation in economics about um, uh, labor market polarization, which uh, we heard um, um, in the last few, few hours discussing about. Um, so it's technological change. And um, Donald uh, helped me a little bit here by introducing the discussion and also the others. And um, I would like to say that uh, all these non-standard employment contracts, temporary um, work, zero hours uh, contracts, part-time. I think that if you, if you work a little bit backwards, the, the logical chain, and if you think uh, from the perspective of an employer, what, what, why would an employer propose this? Uh, because we, we heard today about everything that, what's the employee's perspective. But if we think about what's the employer's perspective on this, why are they willing to offer increasingly in an increasing amount of this kind of contracts, you're going to see that the trade-off they are facing is between the economic benefits of facing lower labor costs from offshoring and uh, not paying social securities and so on, not offering training and education, uh, retraining to, to their workers, compared to versus the economic benefits of having a vertically integrated and a better coordinating decision-making process. Once you have workers with a long-standing relation in a, company, in a company, which are uh, workers who are attached to the values of those, those, uh, that firm, you, you, you're going to have a better coordinated decision process. You might have some spillovers, knowledge spillovers effect there. So this is the trade-off that firms and employers are facing. And uh, I think we have to understand this. Think about... Um, uh, we have to understand the importance of this because it might help us provide a, a, a better skills and a better education if really what is important here is that we teach our kids how to cooperate, how to work together. I, I think that we can, I don't know, excuse me for saying that, but we can beat the machines maybe, okay? If everyone is afraid of machines and robots taking over the jobs, then um, I think that also cutting costs for companies means that they are not able to, to offer education and training opportunities for their workers. So I think that this is a market failure and the government needs to intervene into this and fix it somehow. So we need strong public policies in education. Um, and then, then there is another thing about what we heard earlier about worker being able to connect the dots. This is, um, for me, a, a, a think about workers being able to coordinate. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it seems that the latest technological advances do not kind of do not uh, allow us to coordinate sometimes, to cooperate. When everyone is playing on iPhones and things like this, it's easier to send a message to someone living in another country. It's, we forget this, how shall I say, the human dimension of uh, working. Um, and the last thing I would like to say um, is that some, some time ago, I found a very interesting paper from um, Charles Jones, 
the Stanford University professor, who's kind of a father of endogenous economic growth and technology and growth, and he, he came up with this paper which is entitled simply like Life and Growth. And um, the case there is, is very simple. We can have good technologies that save lives, uh, think about healthcare, medicine, but then also we might have bad technologies that can trigger disasters. Now, when people stop playing this kind of Russian roulette game, consumption growth and consuming more goods and GDP, unfortunately, will kind of drop from uh, drop to zero. So we're going to have a flat uh, path because life becomes more important. And like the president said, the human life dimension matters more. When lives become more important than consuming goods and whatever, you might have first order economic consequences. So with this possible future in mind, which can be decades ahead of us, I would like to, to thank again everyone and uh, leave you with your own thoughts and uh, questions about what the, the best outcomes of this conference has been, have been. And um, yeah, wish you an excellent evening. Thank you.